I am Justin Kanaki, and for the next 40 minutes-ish, we'll be talking about how to create content that matters. Um, let me get a quick uh, understanding of who my audience is right now. How many of you actually currently create anything online right now? Maybe I should have asked, how many of you don't create anything online right now? Two people. All right. Sweet. <laughs> so, this is good. Um, of the stuff that you are creating right now, are you happy with it? Are you getting good feedback from people? Is it doing what you want it to do? Uh, and let me just throw this open question out there. You can raise hands if you have an answer. Why are you making content? Why are you bothering? Chachi? It entertains me. Because creating the content entertains you. Right. Okay. And that's all that really matters. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> now he has a very valid point. Uh, anybody else? Any other reason? Yes. Get a message out. Get a message out. Because you believe you, you have a message that needs to be heard by others. Because uh, I'm paid to get that message And you are paid to get that message Someone believes you need to get that message out. Okay. I saw another hand over on the left. Yes? Promote uh, the entertainment show. Promoting. Okay, so you're, you, you are both producing content and then promoting it. Well, we are producing content to promote the live entertainment show. You were making content to produce content, to make content, to promote the content yeah, yeah. about the content. Okay, cool. Incestuous. I like that. And lastly, back there? Uh, does it makes the hobbies I do feel more legitimate? Because there's like a nominal audience for them? Yep. When people start to give you feedback, you feel like you matter. You feel like you personally are doing something that somebody else is finding a value in. So, Chachi, eventually someone will find value in what you do. <laughs> yeah, and if, if they you, don't, if them, you right? Insist. Exactly. If you insist. All right. So, a little background on me. Most of you, I think, may have some idea who I am. I don't know who I am, really, so I'll make something up right now. Um, I founded PodCamp Pittsburgh five years ago, four years ago now, is it? Four? Yeah. With a variety of people who have since taken it and run with it, and I've moved to Baltimore. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Nothing personal. I'm just down there. Um, before making uh, PodCamp happen, I made a web sitcom from 2003 till 2009, and I had to figure out how do I keep a variety of volunteer actors interested in producing a show that's free and then marketing it to people to get them to watch it, which is also free. And you think the word free was just enough of a selling point, but no. You have to find a reason why they should care about something. I took that concept of the arts transferred it over to doing business, so now I produce content for brands that want people to care about their brands, and now I'm boomeranging back from that to produce more content for myself, because like Chachi, I love me, and I want to wake up happy in the morning, and I wake up happy in the morning when I make content that I enjoy and that people are responding to. So when we say how to create media that matters, what matters? How do we define mattering? Is it what matters to you individually as the maker of that media? Or do you feel obliged to create media for someone else? Maybe you're getting paid to do it. Or maybe your audience is telling you what they like. And the fact that they say, hey, I need X. And you know you can produce X. And when you do, they respond well. It gives you that little glow, that little feeling inside that says, well, my life has a purpose now. I'm making someone else happy other than just myself. Chachi. <laughs> but we have a problem. Why bother? Why make media in the first place? Because it's not like the internet is short on content. It's not like there's not a million things competing for your attention every day, constantly. You all chose to come to this room today for some sort of a reason, though, right? You want to learn how to make what you're doing better. But why did you choose to come here? How, what got your attention? What made you say, I'm going to sit in this room for the next 40 minutes and learn something? Either you saw the session description and said, that's for me, that's content that I want to engage in, or you know who I am and you think I might have something intelligent to say, and I might prove you totally wrong, but those are probably the two reasons that you wanted to come to this room today. Either the topic or the conveyor of that topic was interesting to you, and really as producers of content, that's all we have to go on. Either we make something interesting that a complete stranger would say, holy shit, I have to have that, I have to see that, I have to know about that. Or we become interesting enough that whatever we say is perceived to be interesting by somebody else. Um, and that's it. We're all in competition with each other to out-interesting each other. Right? Every one of us right now is potentially taking notes about this session or live tweeting it or people are watching it on the internet and talking about it. Why would I pay attention to what any of you are saying if there's like 30 tweets right now about this presentation? 
What separates your tweet from somebody else's? When you look in your tweet stream every day, your Facebook feed, or all of the RSS blog subscriptions that you have coming in, you've only got an hour. How do you decide what you're actually going to read or view or communicate with at that point? That is what the session is going to end up being about. I've got a bunch of examples and a bunch of advice for those of you who want to jump over that hump from, look, I made this, to, look, I made this, and it's fucking amazing, and you have to pay attention to it. <laughs> we create media in my humble opinion, to be seen, to be heard, to be noticed, to be validated, as we mentioned in the back, and really to be discovered, because we're all complete strangers, we're all completely anonymous, nobody knows who the hell we are, and we think that we have something in the back of our minds, maybe an experience, maybe a skill, that people would benefit from if we shared it. If I have this great knowledge, if I know something that's really, I think, important to someone else, and I don't share it, who wins? Nobody. I become this miserly bastard hoarding all of this information, I don't share it. And those of you who could benefit from it don't learn anything, so we all lose in the end. But getting noticed is only one step. Uh, this is a uh, graphic from a guy named Dan Zarella, two R's, two L's, very talented guy, who calls himself the social media scientist. And he gave himself that name because um, most of us in social media, we like to do something once and then say, based on my case study, this is the conclusion <laughs> I've come to. But Dan Zarella looks at a ton of information and data and says, based on what all the rest of you have done, here's my generalized concept of what you all need to do next. This is how it's working. So he breaks down what's successful on Facebook and Twitter, what certain keywords are important and popular when people are trying to get their information seen and read, what days are more interesting. Did you know that video shares much better on Facebook than Twitter? Why? Dan Zarella knows. He's a fucking scientist. <laughs> and he wrote this graphic right here called The Hierarchy of Contagiousness because everyone wakes up in the morning saying, I hope what I made goes viral, especially if they paid you to make it. You hope that whatever you made for Brand X goes viral and they give you another contract, right? But even if it's just you and you blog something, it's great if four people read it, but if 4,000 people read it, that would make your day. So you can't get to 4,000, though, until you get to 400, until you get to 40, until you get to four. How do you get there? Well, Mr. Zarella breaks it down thusly. Uh, it's very important to first build your reach because, for example, let's say you have 10,000 followers on Twitter and you tweet something. Did all 10,000 of them see that tweet? <coughs> no, like 20 of them did. So you've got to repeat it endlessly to your 10,000 in segments because you hope that at some point in their busy day they see what you said and they think, oh, I'm going to click. So we have exposure based on a wide variety. We have awareness then. So great, something's in front of you. Right. From having the opportunity to see it to now witnessing it happen in front of you, this tweet, this blog post, this something, there's still an action that has to be taken. I have to click on it. I have to want to click on it. And if I'm really lucky, I made something that people not only click on, but then share or take an action on. Maybe they buy something from me. Maybe they share what I did with a larger media outlet and I get more famous as a result of it. Maybe they just leave a comment that says, hey, thanks, this really mattered to me at this moment in my life. So, in some capacity, they went from having an opportunity to engage with it, to making the conscious decision to engage with it, to engaging. And you'll notice this is a very small sliver, because not everybody is going to take an action on what you've done. You want to get them there, but how do you get them there? You have to create something that they think matters to them. This is where I get self-emotional for like two seconds, right? This is my personal uh, lead into this whole discussion. So. <laughs> for six years I did a web sitcom called Something to be Desired here in Pittsburgh then I moved to Baltimore and the cast could not continue the show because I was not there to keep doing the show and I could not keep doing the show because I had no cast so the solution that we came up with was why don't I move home but that didn't work out so instead uh, from Baltimore we started to produce the show here in Pittsburgh and we're going to do a spinoff called The Baristas, which is going to be a smaller, faster, more easily creatable version of our show. To build some promotion for it, and to get a little bit of promotional cash to help us get the tapes and the other, what you call it, to get the show rolling, we set a little goal of $3,000 on a website called kickstarter.com. And we had 33 days to raise $3,000. Uh, as of today, we are just over the 25, 2600 marks. We're closing in, right? 
My concern was, all right, this is a show that matters to me, it matters to the cast, it matters to the fans of the old show who want to see more from us, but to a complete stranger, how do I get them interested and involved? And what I thought of, literally while recording the promotional video for it, you could see, the, like, there should be a light bulb off over my head. If you pledge, because Kickstarter, a fundraising tool, if you pledge $25 or more to help support the show, you get a vote on casting. So suddenly, somebody who was a complete stranger and couldn't give two shits about my show now has the opportunity to make somebody else's dreams come true or to crush them violently. So when you give other people the power over your own future, that's one way things start to matter a hell of a lot. Uh, influence, that influence over your life. It's a collective, though. You know, we're going to end up with 100-something people, probably, who are going to have a vote on the, the final cast uh, for our show. Any one of those votes isn't going to be the tipping point, just like in democracy. None of your votes are the exact tipping point. But, as this map uh, will illustrate from HubSpot, another Danzarella project, mind you. Uh, this is a tweet map of how something was spread throughout the internet. And in this case, it is uh, Seth Godin post, but you're not saying anything. So, uh, Danzarella went to HubSpot and used a bunch of tools to track how things were shared and tweeted and retweeted endlessly on Twitter, and how often they got repeated throughout the life cycle from the first point, the first mention on Twitter, through the most recent mention as he was studying it. And the size of these individual circles up here is the number of people who are following that Twitter user. So presumably this right here was Seth Godin himself, or his Seth's account when that came out. But as you can see from these various lines and misconstrued garbage, uh, there was no straight line from Seth to complete popularity. If Seth hadn't hit all these points along the way, at each of these larger points that intersected with each other, this would not have become as popular of a story as it did. Everything that we put online works that same way. You hope and pray that you made something that matters to you and then to your audience, but if one quote-unquote important person, if one really powerful media outlet, whether it's a blogger, whether it's an actual news organization, whether it's just a friend who's really interested and tells ten other friends, finds out about what you're doing, it pushes that ball a little bit further. So we can't just make amazing content and then let it sit there and hope and pray that somebody finds it. You have to keep kicking that ball forward. Give them something that makes them want to kick the ball for you. Three reasons that we create media. Education, entertainment, and engagement. I either have something important that I think you should know, I want to make you laugh or cry if I'm a bastard, or I want to engage with you. I want you to do something with me, for me, for us, for America, for the future, for business. So here's step one in my 10 step or my 10 uh, suggestion process of how to create media that matters, right? Help someone. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. We all have the power to do it. Are we all doing it? Yeah, maybe. We get really lost and confused sometimes, or sometimes we think, well, I couldn't really make any kind of a difference, so I'm not going to bother. And yet what's funny is what tends to get retweeted and promoted and shared and like, it's like the feel-good stories on the internet and then in the mainstream are the feel-good stories on the internet and the mainstream. And those feel-good stories traditionally involve helping somebody who would not have been able to accomplish something unless you had stepped in, right? Like, here's a question, how long does it take for 250 geeks to raise $2,500 for kids in Cambodia? The answer was an hour and a half. Uh, Beth Cantor, who does a lot of non-profit social media work, was speaking at Gnomedex, and she wanted to do a test. In the past, she'd been able to use social media to raise a lot of money in a relatively short amount of time, and every time she tried a project, it got shorter and shorter. She'd get more money in less time, because she was meeting and connecting with the right people. So at this event, she said, look, I want to send this individual, Lang Sofereth, uh, to college. She was going to uh, send an African individual who had qualified to go to college but could not afford to, to college. People shared this information and retweeted it at this event, just at this event, and within 90 minutes, this girl was going to college. <coughs> not bad. I think that matters. Uh, also, this guy lost his cat. Not as important, maybe, to some of you as sending a complete stranger to college, but probably important to the guy who had the cat. Right? Um, Helping one person still counts. And in this case, uh, it's an interesting story. You might not be able to read this from the back, but a, uh, a cat wandered onto a train in Ireland, went to a different city and got off the train, and the conductors <laughs> were like, well, okay, there's a cat. So they checked the CCTV images in the station, found out where the cat went, and posted a picture of it online that said, this cat gone on at such and such station, is somebody missing a cat? Uh, and it got retweeted and retweeted endlessly throughout Ireland, and this guy got his cat back as a result of it. So you never know how one little action is going to impact people, 
But to this one guy, if the conductor of this train, if the people in the station hadn't thought, I'm going to send a tweet, it won't kill me, he would never have seen his cat again. And depressing, isn't it? Teach something. No matter what you know, somebody else doesn't know it, and they want to learn how. Uh, up here, small graphic perhaps, uh, this was uh, the 10 most popular searches on Google yesterday for how to make. People want to know how to make jello shots, how to make a resume, French toast, money, a website, friendship bracelets, fondant, <laughs> how to make out, which I'm shocked comes in towards the bottom, how to make a toga, and how to make sushi. I'm going to guess a lot of college kids are using Google right now because that seems like the, that's the core. But people don't know how to do shit. Let's be honest. I don't know how to make out. Someone's got to teach me. So I'm going to go All right. No matter what you know, somebody else doesn't. If you don't share it, they don't get better. And there's a lot of people having really lousy sex out there right now. So help them. Okay? Uh, example. Uh, Natasha Westcote is an artist uh, out on the West Coast. West wow. Coast is on. I know. How convenient is that, right? Um, and she does a show on Justin TV where she paints something from scratch and shows her process of how she does it. If you're an artist and you like to see somebody else's process, there are millions of these people on YouTube doing just that. If they didn't do it, you wouldn't have all this free art education you could take advantage of. Hi, Art Institute. Uh, when you're teaching, by the way, here's an important lesson. Simplify, because time is short and we're busy people. How can you take a really complicated idea and make it so easy that anybody could figure out what it is and why it's important. So the example I wanted to use here was Common Craft. I'm not loading any videos from this presentation, but you might be familiar with Common Craft because what they do is they take uh, anything from financial to technology to social information, and they make amateurishly animated videos that explain it as though a child had done it. And you know what? They're really effective. In fact, we've hosted some Common Craft videos on our site, uh, the PodCamp Pittsburgh site before, to help explain what is social media, what is Twitter. You know, if, you're, if your parents and grandparents or you yourself aren't quite sure what the hell all social media is, Common Craft breaks it down in plain English, and in fact, multiple other languages as well. So they do a good job. Deconstruct and reveal. Uh, you probably know a lot about something. You could probably teach it. But you probably also know a lot of insider information that nobody else knows, especially if you are a huge fan of something, if you are uh, mildly obsessed with something. Um, you're an insider. You're a geek in that specific topic. Other people would love to know what you know, but if nobody makes it available to them, they'll ever find out. And my example here was a podcast that I wish was still continuing and appears to be on hiatus indefinitely called Play Value, where they had a bunch of geeks in New York City in front of a green screen talking about the history of video games. But it's not just, oh, this was popular at this time. It's like a serious breakdown of the creative and economic factors that made everything possible from why uh, Nintendo peaked and then bottomed out and peaked again, what went wrong with every gaming system that's ever failed, uh, the fact that Ms. Pac-Man was actually illegal when it was created, all these sorts of cool things you wouldn't have known unless you start watching the show. So they do a great job of taking a topic that a small segment of the population cares about a lot and giving you a lot of spokes off that central wheel. You might like this, but did you know all of this? And suddenly you spend hours going through all the podcasts and becoming an expert yourself. There's got to be something that you know that you are passionate about that only you and like five friends talk about. But guess what? The internet is all just you and five friends over and over and over and over again. So take that private conversation that you've had and share it with people because they'll be very grateful to find out that somebody else is as odd and bizarre as they are and cares this much about video games or how lipstick is made or hiking the Appalachian Trail. Governor Sanford. Um, Read Right Web did a good breakdown of this, for example, from a strict social media standpoint. Remember the old Spice videos that were very popular about a month ago, right? Um, and did we, most of us saw them, yes? Okay. They made a lot of them that day. And if you didn't read this article, you might not know how they did it, but I found it fascinating. So the old Spice uh, guy got into a room in Portland, it was a set, and they were pumping out videos at the rate of about seven to eight minutes per video. Boom, a new answer, a new answer, all day long. Like dehydration must have set in at some point, I'm sure. But this article breaks down how the advertising agency put it together, how the actors were used, how they were deciding which incoming tweets to craft response videos to in real time. Like, from a, from a social media standpoint and a business standpoint and an advertising standpoint, I find this to be very interesting. But I would never have known about it unless somebody had gone and sort of exposed it voluntarily. They let him in. But 
this is information that I would love to have known. If it wasn't out there, we'd all be losing out. And now that it's out there, you can think, okay, they did it like this. How can I do it like this? That might matter to your business or to your marketing effort. Uh, the mystery of Chimney Rock, let's go back a little bit here, uh, was a choose your own adventure book. <coughs> do we all remember those? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for those of you who missed out on the beauty and glory of choose your own adventure books, they were books that had challenges or questions or opportunities at the end of every couple pages. And depending on what choice you made, you either move forward in the story or die like a violent death. I never and my page. What's that? I never took my finger off the Oh, exactly. Page. Yeah, if your finger doesn't leave the previous page, it didn't count. You can always go back, right? <laughs> so uh, this guy was interested in how these books were actually constructed. So what he made is a flow chart. It's, it's very overblown here, but each of these individual ovals, it's not showing up very well right now on the screen, was an individual page. And he shows how every choice you made leads to every other choice. You can understand like, the thought process that went into the construction of this book. And also then, how this compares to things like computer programming, or perhaps to business planning. If this happens, where do we go from there? So he put this up online for anybody to take a look at, and it sort of boggles my mind, just as an insider geek, how much effort must have gone into making each one of these books. So, preserve and archive. You care about something, you want to share it, you want to teach it, but there's another facet to all of this. And I think it's becoming more important in this digital age. Life is moving so fast that we're starting to lose track of certain things that just mattered before but now don't. And previous generations, their history is going to, in a certain sense, be lost because there's so much volume of modern media being created. Like, okay, take it back. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we only had three TV stations, and now we have tons of them, plus the internet, plus all the radio stations, plus all the satellite radio stations. So when we're all competing for so much media right now, if you went to Google any information about, say, 2008, there are tons of, of information sources available from 2008. You want to know about 1940, 1950? A little harder. A lot fewer sources. So think about preserving and archiving what you currently think is important to you. And I put up this gentleman, uh, I'll make all these links available on my blog next week, by the way, but I put up this gentleman's uh, photo stream. He is producing um, images that I think are interesting. Can you tell what's unusual about this? Does anybody know the answer to this question already? Uh, everything in this picture that you see is a miniature. He is handcrafting models. He is handcrafting trees and telephone poles. And he is recreating the neighborhoods of his youth so that there are photographic images of them in case there weren't any before. Okay. Kind of fucking phenomenal in a certain way. <laughs> and here's the, now let's go back to what matters. Would any of you cared about this if you just like came across it in a magazine? Maybe no, not really. Like it's an interesting old school photograph, fine. But it really mattered to this individual guy that people not forget what this point in time looked like. So he's taking the time and effort to make what I think is some pretty <coughs> awesome media. And as people start to hear the story about it, we have that collective oh sound going through the room. Like, it mattered to him, and as a result, it kind of starts to matter to you, too. Mattering becomes contagious. Uh, there's uh, another photo site that I happen to like a lot called The Impossible Cool at Tumblr.com. You know what it is? It's just photographs of people looking cool. But <laughs> what's interesting about it is it's sort of like hard to find or rare or like never before published archival photographs of mostly famous people, anywhere from authors to actors to scientists to politicians and whatnot. But the interesting thing to me as I look back through it is you're sort of like getting a private glimpse of these people's personal lives and how effortlessly they were able to just look really freaking cool. So Gregory Peck is reading a magazine in the middle of his, of his den, right? Does this information matter? On one hand, you could say absolutely not. It's just more celebrity glorification and whatnot. But what else it is from like a sociological point of view is it's a moment in time. It's a snapshot. It is an image of someone who most of us recognize that we might not have seen otherwise, and it sort of sparks a little thought in the back of your head that says, what separates Gregory Peck from me? Why is he cool? And why am I not cool? Will I be? He's really good looking. He is really good looking. That's true. <laughs> Thank you for, by association, saying that I'm no Gregory Peck. <laughs> but, <laughs> but tastes change, and in 50 years, I could be on the impossible cool <laughs> But it's just interesting because it's like a pause in my day. When I've got all this other information coming in, I usually go over to Impossible Pool and I'm like, oh, that's John Lennon from 1975. Huh. How'd he do that? Uh, make him laugh. By God. If there's one thing we need more of in the world, it is laughter. And the internet is great for that. Um, this is a sample from a webcomic I love called Chainsaw Suit. 
in which it's just really completely bizarre. Uh, senses of humor, I'll say this a thousand times over in my life, senses of humor are very particular. Either you get it or you don't, you think it's funny or you don't, you get it and you still don't think it's funny. Everybody's got their own taste, right? Mystery Science Theater 3000, half of us loved it, half of us hated it, half of us couldn't understand it. That's three halves. But when you think something is funny and you have a sense of humor and you want to share it, Maybe 80% of the people that you share it with don't get any value out of it whatsoever, right? But there's like 20%, maybe even less, maybe one, one person. They get it. And all of a sudden, you have this little private bond where it's like nobody else in the world gets us. But together, together, we can laugh at this one obscure item right here. Humor is powerful. I think of all the ways that we interact with each other, humor is the most clearly definitive way that says this is who I am, what I think, and how everything that I've known up till now in my life leads me to believe that this moment in time is funny. And if you also come to the same conclusion, no matter if you're a complete stranger or not, we have a bond and we mean something to each other. I can now talk to you. We can share other information. And there's a likelihood that we actually understand each other better than you would have thought when we were strangers five minutes ago. So I love using humor as an example. I'm actually using it, self-emotional, again, uh, for the baristas because I figured there's more than just video that we can make for our show, so now all the characters have a Twitter account, and there's a Twitter uh, list that lists what they're talking about. So, in addition to producing video for our show, we're going to be producing text, because you know what? I found out something else very important. Um, people want to engage with information in the format they're most comfortable with, in the amount of time they're most comfortable with, and in the delivery and distribution mechanisms that they are most comfortable with. So, for example, for our show, if all we were doing was video and you didn't have time or didn't have the bandwidth or couldn't see it or just didn't want to watch video on your phone, you might never interact with our show. But if you like our sense of humor and you want to read fictitious tweets from fictitious characters that are potentially amusing, you can subscribe to the Twitter feed and never even watch the video show but still get value out of our sense of humor. So, we're fun. <coughs> What's that? Is it scripted or unscripted? Uh, the shows will be semi-scripted and semi-improvised. The tweets are uh, entirely devised out of my own mind right now. Uh, get personal. Do not be afraid to get personal. It's the internet. We all sort of end up getting a little too personal sometimes and oversharing. Um, but that's how we get to know each other. And let's not forget that 10, 15, 20 years ago, we could not connect in the same way that we do now. So we have an opportunity to get to know each other in ways that were never before possible, right? I never have to actually physically see you or meet you to know too much about you. Bird Baby, thebirdbaby.com, uh, one of our more prolific local bloggers, uh, and she's actually noticing that, what do you mean she's not a baby anymore? Yes, her child is growing up. So when you choose a domain name, be aware that sometimes things change. But... Uh, she shares a lot of information about what it's like to be a mom. And as we know from the mommy blogging population, there's a lot of them out there. Um, the word mommy blogger didn't even exist a few years ago. Who would think that anybody wants to know anything about your kid? Right? I got kids. I'm not telling you about them. Vice versa. I, personally, I don't have kids. I do not. I, that would be fictitious. Nothing that Yes, none that I know of or have been over here is a trailer. And Natural Papa is actually Derek Markham. And he recently blogged about this and explained what it actually was. For the past six years, he and his family, which includes his wife, when they started doing this, his daughter, and now their other daughter, so four of them, decided to go off the grid entirely and just live in that trailer. He gets everything from organic food sources. He, like, sump pumps his own water. The man is as, as grizzly Adams as you could possibly be right now in the modern century. Um, so the TV was like where they went for fun time, and the uh, storage TV, is, or is the storage triangle, is where everything that didn't fit into uh, there went, like extra food, you know, bulk supplies, things like that. And he finally blogged about it and said, look, you might think this is an insane idea, but the odd thing is it's possible to go off the grid and live for six years, and while you're at it, have a baby on top of it. So... It's interesting to me to see somebody living what I would consider to be quite an alternative lifestyle, but then start to understand the logic behind why he made those choices, and to see, oh, it worked. They didn't all die. They, uh, you know, they, they aren't completely ostracized from society. So finding out that you can make these sorts of choices and then figure out, well, how can I maybe apply some of that outside the box thinking to what I'm doing, it's interesting. It matters. Uh, it's okay to remove your self-censor. I've probably sworn up here more often than I should have. Other people do other things online that they probably shouldn't. Uh, do any of us know Penelope Trump? Are we familiar with her? Is that a name? Anybody knows? 
Very interesting woman. She uh, runs RAN, she's still involved with, a website called The Brazen Careerist. And it is basically the young, hip, modern version of LinkedIn, for lack of a better uh, explanation. Uh, she obviously is tweeting things that most sane people wouldn't tweet, <laughs> like I'm late to a meeting and I'm shaving my armpits in the car. Well, okay, is that a gimmick? No. Here's what's actually interesting about Penelope Tron, one of many things, I think. Uh, she was diagnosed uh, in her adult life as having Asperger's. So she doesn't necessarily think that certain things that she says are off color or off base. It's just what comes to mind. She doesn't have the same sort of a self-censor as the rest of us do. And if she tries to, she it screws with her, with her synapses, right? So she has to say what's on her mind. That's really interesting. Like, sometimes I think a lot of us would, would like to not have that censor imposed on us. Like, I, how many times have you sat there and you've typed out a tweet and you're like, no, and you just delete it, right? <laughs> like, it's going to get me fired, it's going to get me arrested, or it's going to get me broken up with. I'm just going to save this for later. Penelope Trunk doesn't have that censor, and as a result, she got in a bunch of trouble by tweeting that she was having a miscarriage in the middle of a board meeting, but that's okay because it's so, hu it's so hard to get an uh, abortion in Wisconsin. Well, thanks, Penelope Trunk, right? Well, it turns out that this was actually a troubled pregnancy that probably wasn't going to make it to term anyway. But you don't know that context. You don't know anything about the situation. You don't know anything about Penelope Trunk when you read this. The world saw this, and people like Jezebel.com and all these other uh, online uh, gossip sites and parenting sites and everything else went ballistic, and now you start to see newspaper polls. Mother tweets that she loses baby! So, outrage in the boardroom. People get really upset when you don't behave the way that everybody else is behaving. But guess what? When you don't behave the way everybody else is behaving, you can start to have conversations nobody else is having. So as a result of this entire, you know, Penelope Trump being pilloried by people who said she made a bad choice here, she finally opened up and, and started talking about the fact that, okay, I have Asperger's. Like, I don't think the same way that you do, and I don't have the same <coughs> sort of sensor. And now she's, in a way, becoming almost like a spokesperson for people with that condition. Uh, she also talks a lot about the troubles that she has. You know, she got divorced, her parents were abusive, now she's moved to a farm. All sorts of weird things that don't happen to normal people. The more often that she talks about these bizarre experiences that happen to her, thank God she is. Because you know what? A lot of other people have what we would think of as bizarre experiences. But if you don't talk about them, there's no inroads for you to have that conversation. She, by tweeting this potentially fucked up information, in a way, normalized a lot of things for a lot of people and made it okay for us to talk about this. I think that matters. Can you fucking believe this? That's iJustine. Pittsburgh product. Justine is in it. Uh, and that's her iPhone bill, which we all remember from a couple years ago, the video that launched iJustine into the national consciousness. Uh, she's now out in Los Angeles making a lot of money, uh, I hope. And she got famous because she got an iPhone bill during the first month the iPhone was out, and it was, however, 300 pages long, it was asinine. She made a video about it. That video went viral because people thought that that was a huge waste of trees to print out a 300-page iPhone bill that itemized every text that she had sent. So because of this video, she ended up on NPR, she ended up becoming incredibly popular, she ended up getting real jobs, etc., etc. right? It's been viewed over two million times, as you can see down there in the background. The power of can you freaking believe this is very important to people. The internet is where we go to bitch. We're very used to that. You look at Twitter and, oh, Comcast sucks. And you tweet that. <laughs> you tweet that for two reasons, really. The original reason was just to vent. The second reason is because you know Comcast is watching and you hope they come and solve your problem. So it's a <laughs> double-edged sword. But what's funny, actually, is as a result of this video, um, they changed the way they bill for the iPhone. So congratulations, Justine, for saving my tweet. Right? And the thing is, at the very end of her video, she had the, la the last slate that comes up uh, talked about the importance of going to electronic billing, go e-billing. She complained about something, and then she said, and here's how you solve the problem. We're filled with a lot of people who like to complain about things, <laughs> but not necessarily explain how to solve the problem, except let's just throw it all out and start all over again. But what's funny about the Tea Party, and maybe you find a lot of things funny about the Tea Party, um, depending on where you fall politically, here's what I think is interesting about it, without getting political at all. You had a bunch of people who were outraged about something. They couldn't maybe place it, but they were just outraged, generally. The internet lets outraged people come together. The internet lets everybody come together. No matter what you care about or are concerned about, no matter what your bizarre sexual fetish or you're allergic to something, there are other people out there online who have the exact same problems and concerns and interests, right? So when you start to get passionate about something, people glom on to that passion. They say, look, here's one guy shouting in the forest. I'm going to go shout with him. There's strength in numbers. 
However, the last thing that we can do, and that maybe maybe the most important, but that's not just it's at the end, is to break down barriers. And I, I've cited this in a few different ways in this presentation, but we're all a lot more alike than we think. But because we've been programmed to believe that we're all special, or because we've been programmed to believe that there's us and there is the other, we have difficulty relating to each other sometimes. And the internet is a great way for us to start to break down the barriers of me versus you, us versus them. Uh, example, this image right here. Does anybody recognize this? This was on Boing Boing back in May. Anybody happen to notice it? You might not be able to make it out too clearly. Um, it is an image from the illustrated version of The Hobbit. Which edition? Oh, the Russian edition. Yeah. Oh, did we not know that Russia also fucking read The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings? Well, they did. And the thing about it is, when you start to realize that there are people in Russia who grew up reading the same literature that you did, it makes them seem less likely to blow you up in a nuclear explosion, doesn't it? So the fact that we can start to realize that everybody around the world is having the same exposure to the same cultural touchstones, the same kind of media, and it's getting easier all the time, it breaks down that barrier and helps us to not see each other as opposites. Uh, you can think about this in two different ways, maybe. Maybe more. You can think globally. You can think what really impacts the world. And uh, once upon a time, we had Alive in Baghdad, which was Brian Connolly out of Boston, Philadelphia area, who got upset because he didn't think the war in Iraq was being appropriately covered by the actual news media. So he did what any enterprising 26-year-old anarchist would do. And he learned Arabic enough to not get himself shot, bought a bunch of uh, handy cams, the cheapest he could find, took a flight into the Middle East <coughs> and made his way to Baghdad, and figured out, out of these people on the ground here, out of these citizens, who can I trust? And after doing all that, he gave them these cameras, and he said, look, here's this website. You shoot video of what your life is like in Baghdad while this war is going on, and we're going to upload it, because we don't think people are seeing your story. They did. He had a team of translators and encoders. People who worked for Alive in Baghdad got shot and killed by uh, missiles, by IEDs, etc. Like, th these were actual journalists, but they weren't. They were just people who were given a camera. And they told stories that may or may not have accidentally or on purpose gotten them killed on occasion. Um, these are stories that we would not have heard otherwise. And Brian knew the power of these stories and wanted to bring them to our attention. So he has since shuttered alive in Baghdad, but other places he has gone, he's been in Mexico uh, to talk about the uh, police uprisings down there. He was like the only American who bothered to go down there. Uh, we've got uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, where he's at right now, live blogging from concerts, rock concerts. He's like, hey, did you know they have rock music in Pakistan? Here it is, MP3. He's breaking down barriers. Uh, you can also do it personally. You don't have to think globally. Just think about something that matters to you that nobody else is talking about. With Penelope Trunk, maybe it was Asperger's. Uh, here's a website called Co-Parenting 101 for a different kind of social condition you might not have thought about. What happens when you get divorced, but you both actually still want to raise your kid? Makes life awkward, doesn't it? What happens when your kid is wondering why mommy and daddy see each other as the other rather than as someone who is there for them? So Co-Parenting 101 is a blog that was uh, started. There's actually some Pittsburgh folks who were uh, strongly involved with it as well. Uh, and it, it's partly group therapy, it's partly uh, informational, and it's partly just a chat forum for people to get together and say, hey, I have the same problem, here's how we solved it. Uh, this is a group that didn't exist a few years ago for a situation that nobody really paid attention to a few years ago. You were like, oh, you're divorced, well, deal with it. But now, <laughs> it becomes uh, a community event people can sort of not even rally around, but at least find strength in others who are experiencing it with them. I think that's important. It all comes down to where the hell is Matt, right? Uh, most of us, I think, have seen this video. In fact, 31 million of us have seen this version of the video as of yesterday. Um, Matt decided to go and dance around the world. If you've seen this video, you know he can't dance. Uh, what he really just does is, is dances in place. And he did that all around the world. As you can see here, 14 months in the making, 42 countries, and a cast of thousands. Um, he did this video once, then got sponsored by a gum company, which I would Wrigley, I want to say, maybe? Try to? Someone. Uh, to go around the world and dance with as many people as they could find. And he's here in Mali dancing with children. But he went all around the globe doing this little dance, and they hypercut it together into this video, including like the demilitarized zone in North Korea, like wherever he could get into, he does this dance. And in the end, you can't help but watch this video and realize that no matter where we are in the world, we just want to dance and have a good time. We're really not that different. It doesn't matter what language you speak, what war you're having, what your problems are, 
in the end, we all just want to feel better at the end of the day. And I think that's what really matters. So what story do you need to tell that will make you feel better, that will make somebody else feel better, that will solve somebody's problem, that will make the world a better place? We can all do it. It doesn't take that much effort anymore. It just takes a little bit of time, a little bit of thought, maybe pushing a button. Hi, that's me. You can find me uh, next week on my blog. I will have this presentation up with all the links as well in case you wanted to follow through on anything that wasn't very clear. So that is my presentation. Let me turn the lights on, and we have about 10 minutes for any questions, if there are. All right, we have 10 minutes for me to impart information. Yep, what? Now take your pants off. No, it's all right. It's a family show. Uh, any questions? Self-censor, please. So, the self-censor's on for today. Uh, does anybody have anything that they... Have questions about anything that you would like to learn more about? Anything maybe like a hands-on tactical thing? Like you were like, I was hoping he would teach me a lot about Foursquare. Like, what, what can I do for you? Um, with all the information that we're bombarded with in the world, how do you, how do you yourself select and choose what you get exposed to? Do you have how do I personally do that? How, yeah, yeah, right. Um, the first thing I had to do was come to peace with the fact that I will never get to see all of it, and that there will always be important things that I will be missing. I did an experiment that some of you who read my blog know about where I tried to read every blog post that I subscribed to in the course of a week. It took me nine hours, I think, to read everything. So it's like a full work day spent reading what other people think is interesting. And that's cool, but I don't have time for that every week. So I had to figure out, okay, I can maybe only read two or three things a day, two or three things a week even sometimes. What makes me click on something and read it personally? Either it's something I think can help me, it's something I think can help somebody else if I sort of read it and say, okay, this is good, I want to share this with the people who listen to what I have to say. Or, it provides me with an escape from what's currently in front of me. That's why humor works, that's why entertainment works. Uh, there's a lot going through all of our minds right now, and sometimes we just go online for that five minute break. So I, you want to say that what really matters is the politics, what really matters is the business, what really matters is you know the important things that we're all taught about. But I think online, we process information differently. Sometimes we just need to get away and go and watch a video of clowns. You know. Hopefully not, but whatever works for you as an outlet. That's it? No other yes? What do you think of Cliff Stoll's comment recently that the internet has, it's so democratized that there's all these voices and you can't hear anything? You could have said that 15 years ago, too. I think it's the exact same thing. It just keeps getting louder. Yeah. So if the question is, can you not hear anything? The response to that is we've got to get better at blocking out the white right noise and finding the people who are talking about what you want to talk about. Right? It's not hard to get bombarded with information. It's hard for us to turn on some blockers. Uh, there's a guy that I cite a lot because people hate him. His name is Andrew Keene, and he wrote the book... Um, uh, shoot, now it's going to slip my mind, isn't it? Um, I'll put it up on the website next week. It is... Um, Another revenge of the amateur, something very similar to that. Basically, Andrew Keene comes down in favor of gatekeepers. He says, look, there is too much information online right now. There is too much information in the world. Nobody's telling you what's good. Once upon a time, you only heard the pop music they let you hear. Now you can hear all this bad stuff, too. And instead of letting us decide what's good and what's bad, Andrew Keene believes that somebody else should do that for us. The cult of the amateur? Cult of the amateur, that's what it is. See, the cult. He doesn't like amateurs. Mm -hmm. Andrew Keene is a very much by-the-books kind of guy, and he was very anti-new media when it came out. And what's funny about it is it's because he had a startup company that failed as social media came out, and he blamed it on social media, but that's another story altogether. The point is, Andrew Keene doesn't think that we're capable of making our own decisions, and in a certain way, if we're bombarded, he might be right. You could make a case that it, life would be easier if people said, just read these ten things. Would you get as much robustness from your lifelong experience on the internet? No, but you might be a little more sane. Mary? question from the chat is, how do you tell what's good information online and what's BS? What's good versus what's BS? Well, I'm sure you could say both of those about my presentation today. So, uh, <laughs> really it's subjective in a certain sense, but it's also, um, who do you trust? Once upon a time, I would have said, whatever people are talking about the most is probably high quality. That's not the case anymore. Um, if you've watched the news anytime recently, you know that what people are talking about isn't always even provable. 
uh, fact has sort of gone out the window, and the need to prove your arguments has sort of gone out the window as well. If, if 85 people can prove we have global warming and one guy says we don't, that becomes equal time right there. So if you want to try and figure out what information is good versus what is BS, I would say two things. Figure out who you trust and then listen to most of what they're saying, but still listen to the contrarian opinion as well, because they might be right some of the time. And the other thing is, test it out yourself. It's a lot easier to see what worked and what didn't when you actually fuck up and say, oh, that's why it didn't work out. But a lot of us are afraid to. We only want to succeed. You know, we're petrified of making the wrong move. Because online, everybody knows when you made a mistake, right? Just do it. We're all going to bounce back from it eventually. Yes? Are you testing any new social sites that you think are Am I beta testing any new social sites? Uh, no. I am not even... Um, I'm, I'm not even using half the sites I should be or could be right now. I've turned off Foursquare. It's a waste of my time. But uh, there are probably a lot of sites. Why? Did you have one you wanted to test out? No. It felt like maybe that's where it was going. <laughs> no. Um, the thing is, if I started to use other sites, it's just more information for me to try and parse through right now. So that's one of my stop gaps for not going any farther into information <laughs> overload is let's not subscribe to eight more RSS feeds and five more services. But that's just me. Yes? Um, noticed in your list, which is a really great list, you don't have something like be trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to prove it? And that's the problem. Where what what credentials? But what credentials would you believe? Like I could I could I know and I like the purist in me totally agrees. But I could also produce my birth certificate, and you could say I'm still a Kenyan. Like there is no real way that we can say anybody is 100 percent trustworthy. So. You're going to choose to trust whoever most closely agrees with what you believe in your heart anyway. Is my but, opinion. But also, isn't it track record too? As you engage that person more. You know, more it's track it's record until you make one mistake. Or if you're a complete idiot who does one thing right and suddenly that's what you get known for. Flip on your bitch. Let's see where that goes, right? But anyway. Uh, we had one more uh, hand back there. Oh, yes. Um, with your own. Mostly failure. Yeah. Now, well, it depends. Now, here's the thing. We're going to have an another session actually throw together called What is Success and What is Failure? Um, did I learn a lot from it? Yes. And did people get something out of it? The people who engage with it did. If I was gauging my success on did I make a complete living off it and, you know, millions of people now know my name, no, I have not reached that stage yet. But I'm at the stage where the feedback that I'm getting from the audiences that do engage with what I make is valuable to me, it helps me improve what I'm doing, and it helps me understand them better. So even if I don't necessarily agree with them, it's nice to know why they disagree with me. So to me, those are all successful. If I hadn't produced this media, I wouldn't have learned more about myself and my audience in the process. So that's good. Anything else? We have time for one more, or we can all run out of here and get coffee. Yes, let's do that. Coffee. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.